you guys. Say hi. Hey, Miss Mary. All right. See you guys. All right, Johnson, stay out of the church. Henry and Noel, go ahead, say hi to the church. All right. you back. All right. See you later. Have a good day. Hey, Pearson, say hi to the church. Hi, hi from the Pearsons. We miss everybody. We love you. All right. Sounds good. See you later. Have a good Sunday. Cook. All right, see ya. See ya. Hey, Mo All right, Moody. Say hi to the church. Hello there. Yeah. We miss everybody. All right. Have a good Sunday. Mobile, say hi to the church. All right, sounds good. Have a good Sunday. You too. All right, Barry, say hi to the church. Yeah. All right, there's Gianna too. Look at there, Gianna. <laughs> Herb, say hi. Look at it. There's Emily with her nice haircut. Look at that. All right. There's Jacob. <laughs> See you guys. Hey, Smith. Hey, All right. Hey, everybody. Nice, you guys. Yes. All right. Have a good Sunday. All right, see ya. All right, we know Mrs. Patton's got to get her words in. Come join us. Yeah, all right. <laughs> see ya, have a good Sunday. See you tonight. <laughs> Say hi. Hi. Yeah, all right. Have a good Sunday. All right. All right, Lindals. Say hi. Hi. Yeah. Hey, there's Jordan. There's Cadence. All right. Have a good Sunday. See you, Jose. All right, cat parts. All right. Have a good Sunday. All right. See you later. All right. Hi, right, turn. All right. All right. Have a good Sunday. See you later. All right, here's, here's Sasha. Hi. Yeah. All right, have a good day. Mikey. All 
All right, say hi. Hi, Alan. Joyce is here. Yes. Miss everybody. All right. Have a good Sunday. There's the Osorios, hey! There's the Youngs. All right, have a good Sunday. This is record. I miss you Wednesday night. I love you. See you later. Have a good day. <laughs> See you, Dell. Yeah. Yeah. Johnny, Eddie. say hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> All right, have a good Sunday. You have been so faithful to our church, and you that are not able to get to church, but you're tuning into our um, our um, YouTube channel, trying to remember what they call these things, the YouTube channel. You've been able to watch the services online. Thank you for your faithfulness. I hope you'll stay in touch. Call me, call the church. Um, you're, but these are unusual days. If you just want to call or send a text just to say hi to the pastor or somebody on staff, you're not a bother to us. We're, we're happy to know you're still alive and, and um, you're above, above water, not drowning in all the messed up world we're in. But please uh, keep in touch. And um, I hope you're getting our letters. We, we've sent out a couple of a newsletter and a couple of other letters letting people know what's going on. If you haven't received any mail in the past few weeks, then somehow you got off our mailing list and uh, get a hold of uh, the office. Call me, call the church office and, um, and just say, I'm, I'm not on the mailing list or I missed it. And most everything we send out, we can email it out. Uh, we do have at least once a week now, a church wide email going out. And um, if you're not getting those call, give us your email address. Cause we're letting, trying to let people know what's going on via email and text. And then of course we use mail. Cause I think some people like mail. Uh, before I get started tonight, I want to mention um, on, on Monday's Memorial Day, and normally we have a big program and we bring all the veterans in and make a big deal if the veterans share their testimonies. And, and um, uh, you know, it's a tragic thing when, when we start forgetting who, who bought our liberty, and that goes all the way back to the cross and Jesus Christ, but also throughout the years in American history, those who gave us freedom and uh, may we not ever um, take lightly our freedom, our flag, and that ought to make us mad. Uh, these uh, these uh, communist people who are pretending to be um, upholders of the Constitution, who are literally lording over people in our cities, uh, telling people they are our, our city leaders and county and state and federal leaders. Not they're not our boss. They're supposed to work for us. And uh, in regard to church. Uh, church services, attending church, businesses, uh, our behavior. Uh, the, the government doesn't have that right. The, there is provision for a few, a couple of weeks or little tiny windows of time. There is no historical or uh, constitutional liberties granted to the federal government or the state to control our behavior week after week after week after week. And this has gone way too long. Um, and I'm not for a violent overthrow, but I'm for overthrow of people who are communists. We need to drop them off in Russia or China if they want to be a communist. We are a representative republic. Uh, the words de democracy and republic are different, but the bottom line is we the people, of the people, by the people, for the people. And um, there's a whole lot, not a lesson on uh, history here and the, the on a civics lesson, although a bunch of our founders, I mean a bunch of our uh, political leaders need a civics lesson, 
But um, let's don't forget our military. And um, we're going to have a service here on Monday. It won't be anything like what they normally are. But we're not going to let Memorial Day go by and not do something. And I don't think cyber activities are real. I don't think they're real. Any more than social media is not social. It is a proven fact that people who are active on social media have a pit, more pitiful social life than those who don't use social media. Social media isolates. It does not connect. Social media connects you to a device. You know, here you got your, your phone and I'm looking at whatever. But uh, social media doesn't connect you to people. People are real, warm-blooded, fleshly things. And for me to look at a screen with eight pictures on it, like some idiot uh, they're promoting on, on commercials all over the TV, that's not life. Life is people. And especially we're coming to Memorial Day and, and summertime. It's going to the beach, going to the mountains, going to the lake, going to the river. It's fishing, hunting. Uh, it's going out and playing a baseball game. It's having family gatherings and barbecues. And nobody's got a right to take that away from us. And, and scientifically and medically, more and more is finally creeping out to prove that, that none of this stuff they're doing has stopped anything from happening or kept anything from happening. So anyway, I've got a, an attitude about all of it. Um, but I'm not worried about it. I, that's why I don't listen to the news very much. People send me clips of news here and I think, I only want, I just want a, a thimble full now and then. I need a little bit of information, but I don't let that stuff get in my head. It'll discourage me because there's a lot of corruption going on in our country. What General Flynn has faced is so wrong, uh, so corrupt. Everybody that was involved in that needs to sit in jail for at least two years. That's the, the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what that's talking about there. What you thought to do to someone is what we're going to do to you. And... Uh, Boy, it's a, it's a corrupt world, but it's always been a corrupt world. God's always been good. Man, men have always been shameful. God has always been faithful. Governments have always been um, overbearing, animals consuming wretched things. And, and so don't let it bother you. So shut off the media. Shut off social media. Shut off the news a little bit, uh, just a little bit couple times, two or three times a week, maybe something daily. But I'll tell you, the most discouraged people, worried people, frustrated people I know are the ones who sit in front of that box, the Hellavision, the boob tube, all those names that were on it back when it was Gilligan's Island. Um, they're the, and Father knows best, it was bad then. And my goodness, it's sure gotten to be corrupt now, but it's not the movies only. Now it's news. And what a terrible thing. Hey, so what we're going to do, we're going to have Memorial Day service, 10 o'clock, drive-in Memorial Day service. We're going to do the best we can to honor our veterans, remember our fallen heroes, um, and, and take a, a little bit of time for patriotism. It won't be a long service. Normally, we'll take an hour. But without the veterans coming up and sharing testimonies, it might be a 30-minute service. We're not going to have a picnic following it. We are one more time going to try and and, and by the way, if you have a picnic at your house, go for it. Invite me over. Uh, but um, we're not having something here. This, this, it's only, I'm only making a, this is, we're only making a promise of four days here. So uh, what we do next uh, is up to the church members. But um, um, but Memorial Day, let's, let's don't forget our, our folks who put on a uniform and were willing, even those who nothing happened, never, those who never left the States, never went overseas, they still were willing to. And they, they laid their lives on the altar. And uh, what a privilege to be an American. Now, uh, so, but again, don't let the corruption and the mess panic you. God's in charge. Uh, God's got things well in control. You can trust him. Let me read a verse and uh, over in the book of Revelation. And just going to read a, uh, a quick verse. What we're going to do, well, let me, before I read the verse, let me tell you what, uh, what I'm doing tonight and in the next few nights. Um, I got saved and left right away. I wasn't going to any church. And I left for college four days later, a secular college. I went to White Temple Baptist there simply because the coach of the basketball team attended there and he invited me. It was right on the corner of our college property. It's like a square. And he was the corner diagonally off, right off college property. And so it was the closest college. And, and I was saved. You ought to go to church. Um, it was some months before I went. But I did start going, I don't know when, I got saved in August, went to school right away, and, and um, 
sometime during basketball season, I started going to White Temple Baptist Church. I had no idea why. It was there. The coach went there. My friends that led me to Christ and influenced me, they were uh, attending North Valley Baptist, not in Santa Clara, but North Valley Baptist in Reading, Pastor Blue's church. And so I was getting contact with guys, young men my age, who were going to a Baptist church, and they had started attending a, a small Bible institute there that Pastor Blue had begun, a Bible institute where the teachers were local pastors who came and taught each day, and uh, they were all hands-on, people doing the work of God. And um, that was my contact I went from the secular college to the Bible college, spent a year and a half there. I was exposed to the ministry of Dr. Jack Hiles, First Baptist Church in Hammond, and his college, Hiles Anderson College. I left Northern California, went to Indiana, and I spent the next three years under the ministry of Dr. Jack Hiles, three and a half years somewhere there. I came to California and started the church. Now, I'd only been a member of these two churches, two independent Baptist churches, came here, and the question was, what am I going to call my church? And honestly, I had no idea. I had no idea what to call it. And I thought, well, I guess I've been a member of these two Baptist churches. So I'll call it Baptist. I didn't know why it was Baptist. I just did. And, um, and I was coming by faith with no money, so we called it Faith Baptist. I never knew there was any other churches called Faith Baptist. They just came up, and that's what we called it. And uh, there's a lot of them. But we're not affiliated. We're an independent church. Now, along the way, I heard comments like, um, uh, somebody said, what would you be if you were a Baptist? And the guy says, well, I'd be ashamed. And you la, ha, ha, that's funny. And, um, um, but had, I, I even, I think early in our ministry, I might have even said, if I didn't say it, I thought it, um, I'm a Baptist, but I, there's no way I could show you scripturally why I'm a Baptist. I'm a Bible believer, and, and the Baptist, independent Baptist churches are the most like I believe the Bible teaches, so that's what I'm affiliated mentally with. We were no strings attached, no denomination, no association. We were totally independent, um, as most of my friends are. Um, but um, I was a Baptist because most of the people that I believe were following the Bible, I, th I thought the independent Baptist churches were following the Bible closest. That's why I was a Baptist. And I might have made the comment, you could never show your Baptist biblically. And that, um, but you know, when you don't know very much, it's easy to act like you know a lot because you, you know, when you're in a little, a little small pond, you can be the biggest fish. Um, I found out years later uh, an awful lot more about our Baptist heritage and where we came from. I've taught a little bit on it here and there, but I thought, um, you know, because people wonder, um, you know, here's the Lutherans, here's the Catholics, and here's the Methodists, and, and here's the Calvary chapels, and here's the Mormons, and here's the Jehovah Witnesses and the Baptists, and it's kind of like where everybody's got their own ideas. And uh, where do we fit into religion as a whole? And and where do we where do we belong? Now, <clears throat> I've got a, a graph here, and I'm going to show you this one. Then it's going to show up close on the screen. But this is basically 2,000 years of church heritage, and um, good friend of mine. Uh, Greg Nash put this together, and uh, he gave me permit. I, I saw this, and man, this is great. I said, "Can you, can I buy some copies of it, or can I, what can I do with these?" And he, he just sent me the, the whatever you call it, the whatever it is digitally, and he said, "Do what you want with it." And uh, so, um, I, this is a very helpful thing. It's put together by a very smart man, and. Um, and so if you'd, if you'd like to even get one of these, you'll see a little bit of it along the way as I go through the next few, um, few days. But um, we could get you a digital copy. I don't know if we I'm guessing we could email it. But talk to me at church or, or Wayne Record. Um, he, he has it on his computer. And, and we'll be happy to get you a copy of this. And, and uh, you know, if you want to go to Nash Publications, every, he's got music, he's got books, he's got charts, he's got history. He is, he's, he's incredible. You can trust everything Greg Nash has got uh, that I know of. I don't know of anything where he's not lined up like we would. He's shorter than me, but that's all right. We accept short people. Um, but anyway, so I want to talk to you a little bit about where we are, who we are, where we came from. And uh, But first, I want to read a couple of verses. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 17 it's the last book of your Bible, 
And it's a singular, it's not revelations, plural. It is revelation singular because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's when Christ is one day going to be revealed to the church and then revealed to the world and then uh, all that goes with it. <clears throat> so in, in Revelation chapter 17, it says, And there came one of seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, Come hither. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. Now, several things, they would call them types or symbolic things. Usually a, uh, a religion is classified as a female, as a lady, like we have hurricanes, like we have ships. Uh, we name ships and different things, and they're, they're usually named gender-specific. Um, um, and so um, in the Bible... When you're talking about, um, it talks about a religion, often it refers to as a woman. Secondly, in this passage, um, um, of course, we know uh, literal fornication, immoral relations between people who are not married. Um, that's a real thing. Well, the world, world or the world system, um, God likens this a Christian being involved, and even an unsaved person being involved with the world, that, that it's like, um, it's like a, uh, a they, he calls it adultery. For a Christian to turn from the Bible and God to the world, God used the term adultery. Uh, for the unsaved world to have a relationship with all of the worldly things and, and to love the money and the fame and the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of, the light, the, the lust of life and the, uh, and the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, First John defines, those are the things that that um, uh, he calls it with committing fornication with the world. So we've got the 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 woman who represents a religion, and we've got the uh, the the world system and people uh, that are involved in this world system. It's like committing fornication with it. So it, it's where our heart and our passion is. Um, and then there's usually waters, a seas, great waters. Multitudes of waters are, are often um, a type or a symbol of, of great masses of people. And so if you look down there, um, let's just say um, you look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 17. There came one of the seven angels, and he says, I'll show you the judgment of the great whore. Now this is the, that's a female who has, um, it represents a religion that has committed a, uh, has a passionate love for the things of this world. And so they refer to this religion as a whore because this religion, instead of being passionate for God in the Bible, is passionate for gold and power and, and all the things of the world. And in verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So all of the the relationship this religious, this giant religion has with the world, all of this love for for things and love for power and love for for dominance and love for for riches, um, the kings of the earth all got involved with this religion, and the people of the earth that are involved in this religion, and it's a very worldly religion. It's a religion where gold matters much and. And uh, God matters little, and the Bible matters little. And so verse 3 carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That's more about prophecy and countries that are in Daniel and here, but we won't talk about that. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and there is a, a uh, country whose flag is purple and scarlet, and uh, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and that religion, the, the Roman Catholic religion, is the, is the wealthiest 
the uh, the most wealthy organization on the, on earth billions of billions in the Vatican has and um and uh, anyway and so uh, verse 6 and i saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and um the story there tells that that of course the the catholic church martyred many many millions of god's people and um a very tragic story now we're going to talk about Bible, a little bit about Bible and what the Bible says about churches and different churches. But if I were to take time, we could go through point by point. And, and uh, this, this woman sits on seven hills, and that's what they call Rome, uh, the city on seven hills. But um, in regards to religion, um, I'm going to take one more moment and look at this, this map. And so I'm going to have the map show up on the screen. If you would look back at the beginning, the, the, the beige, I'm a little colorblind. The beige on the bottom would be where world religions come from. And the reddish color at the top, that would be the roots of Bible-believing churches. And so and I'm not saying that the people at the bottom, none of them are Christians, not saying that at all but their roots are different and will explain where the different churches and the different religions came from. Um, you notice at the top uh, on the dark red, it says Jesus organizes his church and that's Matthew 10. And, and uh, there's no, well, maybe people do debate a little bit when he actually started the church, but when Jesus called uh, the disciples, uh, we can come back to me now. Um, um, when Jesus called his disciples, he called them to meet with him in, in Matthew 10. And, and that the word church is a, a word, it, it, it's a Greek word, ekklesia, called out assembly. Jesus called the, the 12 out of the world and assembled with him. It might be the first um, official church. But um, a little later, Jesus talked about if you have a problem, take it to the church, singular. And so we know the church was established somewhere during the book of Matthew and then uh, the church met, and of course, in the book of Acts, and the power of God fell, the Holy Spirit filled, and they went out and preached and started churches, plural. So, um, but uh, what we're going to do in these next few nights is, is I'm going to follow the church Jesus started and then show you where, because I've had people ask me, where did all these churches come from? And, um, and, now, and I'm going to show you where, where they came from. I'm not going to have, it's not going to be a world religion class. I've taught that. Um, it's just going to be a brief overview, mainly to help us understand who we are as Baptists and why we're Baptists. And so anyway, that's just an introduction. That's all we've got time for tonight because we're going to get to some soul winning. Hey, finishing up uh, our introduction on, on churches and where we came from, where Baptists came from, I just want to mention for soul winning tonight, we got a privilege. Dr. Dennis Coral, is take, he took some time to uh, just give us a little bit. He's a great soul winner. He was instrumental in sparking soul winning at Faith Baptist Church. And actually, he's the first person that ever took me out soul winning. Uh, I kind of went on my own and learned here and there. But when he came here for our first revival meeting, I think we had 150 converts baptized in a 12-day meeting. And uh, Brother Coral, we were out soul winning every single day, preaching every night. That was 38 years ago. He's the same as he was back then. He's a rough, gruff old guy. Uh, but what a blessing, and uh, a barroom bouncer when he got saved, and um, but what a faithful man. And so I asked him, his, his world, we're going to take a Wednesday offering for him, I think this next Wednesday. Um, he's an evangelist, lives in church after church meetings, and of course our evangelist, Kevin Walker, and he and others, they don't have churches to go to. And so listen to Brother Coral uh, as he's speaking. He is at a meeting, and actually he's at a meeting where uh, one of our young people uh, now attends church and, and they're on staff there. Uh, but, but, uh, but pray for he and his wife, pray for their ministry, and uh, grab some great soul winning truths from, truths from Dr. Dennis Coral. Brother Goddard, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to address your people on soul winning. And the first few statements I'd like to make have to do with philosophy and soul winning is not soul winning, it is prospect hunting. Uh, if you find a prospect, leading them to Christ is not a big job. Oftentimes we spend our time arguing with suspects instead of dealing with prospects, so the big issue is knocking on enough doors 
to find the prospect. Once you find them, leading them to Christ is not like wrestling alligators. Uh, it's a different story. And then, of course, the two words that would solve most of our soul winning deficiency, two words, are the words, go ye. The big issue is being out there and doing it. And the remainder of the time, I'd like to deal with something that I call the Luke 7 principle. In that passage of Scripture, there were two people forgiven. One was forgiven 50 pence, the other 500 pence. And my point being that I think we need to spend more time getting people lost than we often do. It's not impossible to get somebody saved uh, if you don't spend a lot of time on getting them lost as they acknowledge that they're lost. But the deeper you take them into their lost condition, the more appreciation they have and the more obligated they feel and the easier it is to get them to follow through and come to church. And there's a lot of disappointment among Christians that go soul winning because out of those they win to Christ, there are so few of them that they ever get to church. Some of that can be cured. Now, I'm, we're living in a society that's not particularly fond of church, and uh, people aren't programmed for church like maybe they once were in years gone by, but in spite of all of that, uh, somebody is not lost as soon as they admit that they are a sinner. And if you can't get them to acknowledge that they're sinners... Uh, you're never going to get them saved if you don't first get them lost. All you're going to do is get a prayer out of them. I do not need a cure for sin until I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I don't need a cure for sin if there is no penalty to be paid. So in getting people lost, number one, it has to do with convincing them that they are sinners by nature and by practice. And of course, Romans 5 and verse 12 clarifies that wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned and uh, we inherited a sin nature from Adam and if I have a nature it means it makes certain things natural it gives me certain leanings and because I have a fallen nature and I'm a sinner by nature the natural tendency is to be a sinner by practice and all of us have broken the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And in James 2 and verse 10, he said, if we keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, we are guilty of all. You know, several years ago, I was dealing with a man in Michigan, and uh, I showed him Romans 5 and verse 12, and I said, according to that verse, if I'm going to be honest, I'd have to admit that I am a what? And rather than me telling him, I had him tell me, he told me, that I was a sinner. And then I turned the tables on him and I said, and according to that same verse, if you're going to be honest, you'd have to admit that you are a, and he said, well, hope not, hope not. And I said, well, what does the verse say? I said, you know, I'm not talking to you about our hopes, but what did God clearly say? Well, I hope not. By the way, I dealt with him for probably 15 minutes. I turned to the preacher and I said, well, preacher, we need to go. This guy's too good to be saved. He doesn't think he needs to be saved. Jesus apparently didn't die for him. And I turned around and started for the door. The guy followed me to the door and he said, hold it, hold it. He said, I'm a sinner. And I thought this ought to be good. It took me 20 minutes to get him to admit he's a sinner. Uh, he'll never want to admit that as a sinner, he's going to die in this sin and go to hell. But you know, once he acknowledged that he was a sinner, instead of hedging on that, he never argued about the consequences of sin, but he was convinced in his heart that he was a sinner. He was trying to be evasive. But I'm not going to push past him acknowledging his sin and telling me he's a sinner, because I, I can go ahead and get a prayer out of him, but if you're not a sinner, you don't need a Savior. And... Uh, so I always spend quite a bit of time not only on the fact that we're sinners by nature and by practice, but also on the fact that the consequences are fixed to that. The wages of sin is a second death in a literal burning hell. But once again, rather than lecture them, I don't tell people they're going to hell. I show them the scriptures and get them to tell me. I'll ask them according to the Bible if the wages or the consequence of sin is uh, death, and that's a second death in hell. 
according to the Bible, if I were to die in my sin, where would I go? That's not going to happen because I'm saved. But I'm using myself as an example. Where would I go? They tell me you'd go to hell. And according to that same verse of the Bible, if you die in your sin, in your present condition, where will you have to go? And uh, I want to get that response, but I deal with sin, I deal with the topic of hell, and I deal with judgment. And on every case, uh, I uh, make them tell me what they see in the Scripture. Instead of me telling them they're sinners, I get them to tell me. Instead of me telling them they're going to hell, I get them to tell me. Instead of telling them that they're enemies of God, when we look at Revelation chapter 20, I get them to tell me, verse 12, that they're going to face God, give account, and sin is enmity with God. Now back to that Luke 7 principle, and I'll be finished. Uh, Jesus said to the person at the house that uh, uh, he had forgiven 50 pence, it didn't give him, didn't put a kiss on him, didn't do anything for him. He asked him a question. He said, uh, if somebody owes 500 pence and they're forgiven, and somebody owes 50 pence and they're forgiven, who will love him most? the person that was given, forgiven 50 pence or 500 pence. And he said, the person that was forgiven 500 pence. And Jesus said, thou hast rightly judged. So what are you getting at, preacher? I'm getting at the fact that if I'm going to get people to gladly receive Christ and not be twisting their arms at the end, it's important that I get them to see the true predicament they're in and how bad it really is before I start giving them the solution And I will go this far, uh, that when people get saved, the deeper the conviction, the easier it is to get them to follow through. And the lighter the conviction, the less obligated they feel. So the more I can make them feel the weight of their sin debt before I give them the cure, the more obligation they feel and the easier it is to get them to follow through. And I've proven that over and over again, our tendency is this. If we have an excellent prospect who is responsive, our natural tendency is to hurry up and get past the bad news because this guy's wide open, he'll pray with me, and I don't want to waste any time. Well, believe me, it's not a waste of time, even with a very receptive person, to spend time on the bad news so that they, number one, acknowledge the depth of their need and feel the urgency, number two, so that when they get saved, they feel the relief and have a desire to follow through. I was uh, witnessing to a little old black lady down in uh, Arkansas, and when I started talking to her, She did a very similar thing to the man in Michigan. She was a pretty good person, so she was telling me she was not a sinner. And I worked on her for probably 20 minutes, finally. I got through to her, finally she acknowledged she was a sinner. I went through the rest of the plan of salvation. She got down on her knees, asked the Lord to save her. And as soon as she got saved, she got up and said, started prancing around. Uh, You said, what did that mean? Relief. But she, as long as she was pretty good, she didn't think she needed anything. But when she finally saw herself like God saw her, she acknowledged the need, gladly settled it, and experienced the relief. By the way, she came to church that night, walked the aisle, got baptized. But it is vital that we understand the Luke 7 principle in soul winning and be very thorough on the bad news. Thanks again for the opportunity. God bless you, Brother Goddard. God bless you, folks.